Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Thursday edition of the Orange and Brown Talk podcast. Dan Lobby with Mary Kay Cabot and Ashley Bastock. We are at the Browns facility right now. They are wrapping up their day here, getting ready to face the Washington Commanders on Sunday at FedEx Field. Um, really kind of a quiet day here, Mary Kay. Uh, I, I guess let's start with the story that you just posted as we're recording this. It's, it's about four o'clock here on Wednesday. David Njoku, I thought very interesting. He said, we've got no one to blame but ourselves. Uh, when it comes to the Browns not making the playoffs, they were officially eliminated on Saturday. You know, we're watching the Steelers playing a meaningful game this week. The Ravens are already in. It's certainly disappointing that the Browns aren't at least playing meaningful football right now. And I thought it was interesting. I wouldn't expect anyone to sit up there and make excuses, but I do think David Njoku, who has been the voice of reason a lot this year, all of a sudden, I, I thought it was interesting that, that he was so strong on that. Yeah, and you know what? I, I think he recognizes that, look, even if he had just caught the ball on the goal line for that touchdown on uh, Saturday against the Saints in that 17-10 loss, you know, they wouldn't have had, a, you know, a great chance to make the playoffs. They still would have been in the 1% uh, range, but but still, they could have kept it going a little bit. And I think he feels, and a lot of other play, players feel, if they could have all just done a little bit more, uh, that they would be contending for the playoffs right now. And they should be. I think we can all agree, this team should not be 6-9. and nine. You know, every day we stand there at the podium and players such as David Njoku, who just uh, was made an alternate to the Pro Bowl, you know, stands up there and talks to us. Nick Chubb stands up there and talks to us. He's third in the NFL in rushing yards. Amari Cooper comes up there and talks to us. He just recently went over 1,000 yards. Then you've got Pro Bowler Denzel Ward. You've got Miles Garrett. You've got Jadavian Clowney. No way should this team be 6-9. and nine. They know it. The coaches know it. Everyone knows it. And Ashley, it kind of it has to sting a little bit to kind of see how this AFC playoff picture is shaking out because everything is still setting up for teams that are kind of at least on the fringes, right? I mean, Tua is in the concussion protocol. He's not going to start this week for the Dolphins. The Jets are like, the Jets are collapsing. Um, just things are wide open for that seventh spot, so much so that the Steelers are still in it, and all they had to do was, was win a football game on Saturday. Like, the Browns could still be in it. Yeah, in so many ways, it's like that almost has this like Groundhog Day element to me, like compared to last year, because it was very similar, right? They didn't play the Steelers the last week of the season, but it was the second to last week of the season. And it was very similar where all season we're watching the Steelers and we're like, uh, I don't know, they probably don't have a shot to make the playoffs. And what do they do? Weasel their way into the wild card at the last minute and they thump the Browns on the way to doing it. Um, and of course, this year, you know, the Browns had the Steelers two weeks from now. But like you said, it's it's very similar. They're still in it. Their records aren't that far apart. It's like, wait a second. And that's the difference, I think, with, and I think why there's been so much frustration with this team this year. It's like, you look at the talent they have on paper, and it's there. But then you have teams like the Steelers, or at times the Ravens, where you look at the guys they're throwing out there, and it's like, they just go and find a way to win with some, like, no-name guys. And that's the reality of the situation. And this team can't do the opposite. Yeah, I mean, Mary Kay, I think that's... I would say the Browns are a more talented roster than Pittsburgh. Now, obviously, Pittsburgh has guys like T.J. Watt, and um, you know they've got some receivers that are really good. You know, you'd love to have a, a Deontay Johnson on this team. Would have loved to have a George Pickens on this team, right? But but the Browns are probably a more talented team, one through fifty-three on paper, than than the Steelers. I don't think that's crazy. I think you could say that about the Ravens too, like. Obviously, when it was Jacoby Brissett first Lamar Jackson, that's going to go in the Ravens' favor. But the receiving core, the, you know, the running backs, you know, even areas where the Ravens are strong, you could make the case that the Browns are at least equally as good. There's certainly areas where the Ravens are better too, but the rosters are at worst really close. But probably the Browns have the edge talent-wise, at least on paper, over both of those teams right now. Yeah, that's what makes it so puzzling and so frustrating for all of these players and for all of the fans. I mean, you can't go anywhere uh, without running into Browns fans that are just fed up and tired of this and are, are sick of watching losing football. I mean, if when you think about it, uh, Miles Garrett, 
has made the playoffs one time in his six seasons. Same thing with David Njoku, one time in six seasons. Nick Chubb, one time in his five seasons. I mean, these are like Pro Bowl players that some of them might end up in the Hall of Fame, right? And, uh, and here they are, not able to make the playoffs. The Browns have made the playoffs one time in the last 20 years. One time in the last 20 years, okay? Uh, and obviously that was in 2020. I mean, it's it's bad. This is a bad situation right now, and um, and you know, you know, the hope for the future obviously is Deshaun Watson. I mean, he's going to have to be the reason why everyone has hope next year, why everyone can get excited about the season, and why the Browns contend for the playoffs. Because you're right, Dan. This roster, top to bottom, is better than some of those rosters that you're talking about. The Steelers, I think the Ravens, not necessarily the Bengals, but um, but better than some of those teams, and they just don't have anything to show for it. And I think that is why uh, you will see some heads roll after the season. Yeah, so we're standing out there at practice today, and, and we're kind of looking at, okay, what do they do here, or what do they do with this guy and that guy? And it sort of strikes me, and some of this is, Look, we're in the final two weeks of a meaningless season. It's just gone really poorly. And I think that kind of shades your view a little bit. It's hard not to, to be a little down on some things that maybe you shouldn't be down on. But it felt to me, Ashley, like a lot of the hope right now is just Deshaun Watson coming back next year and being Deshaun Watson. Yeah. Are the Browns putting too much? I'm not saying that Deshaun can't do that, but are the Browns putting a little too much faith in that right now? I don't know that they, like, are, because it's kind of hard to know, like, what's going on behind closed doors as far as, like, discussions that they're having about what other parts of this team they need to shore up. But, like, I do think that's maybe the outside perception. And I think, like, yes, like, I, I certainly think that they need him to come back and be Deshaun Watson. But I also think it's important to remember that's only, like, a part of it for me. Like, I do think there are some other, like, serious issues with this defense, for example. And, hey, why has your defense started so slow the last two years? And, hey, you don't really have any reliable, like, game-wrecking defensive tackles you can use right now. And, and hey, you, you need another receiver probably on offense. And, hey, what are you going to do with Jed Wills? Like, there are all these other questions that, like, Deshaun might make life a little bit easier. And we talked about this when he was out. Like, it's not that he can fix a defense, but... When you have a quarterback who can make explosive plays, which we haven't seen yet a ton from him since he's come back, if we're being honest, it allows the defense to play more freely, I think, play more aggressively. So he can change things in that way. But again, it's kind of like with him coming back. Like if, if he looks like Deshaun Watson from 2020 next year, I don't think it's curing all of these problems. Yeah, and I mean, Mary Kay, Deshaun Watson from 2020 was still on a team that didn't win a lot of games. So you've, you've got to have stuff around quarterback I mean just look like Patrick Mahomes is the best quarterback in football but he still has to have an offensive line that can protect him and a guy like Travis Kelsey and some receivers that can go make plays for him a great play caller in Andy Reid there has to be structure around that so I I guess how much does just Deshaun Watson being Deshaun Watson elevate this beyond what we've seen and how much is you know sort of what Ashley was getting at some structural issues some issues on the defensive side of the ball things like that well, I certainly think that, that they're going to take a good, long look at the other two units that didn't pull their weight. Now, they do have to add, I think, I, I'm going to keep saying it, uh, I think they need to add another Pro Bowl caliber receiver. If it were up to me, it would be a very shifty, speedy guy that can, you know, stretch the field, that can get, you can get the ball in his hands short and he can, he can take it and get that uh, run after catch. Uh, you know, sort of like a poor man's Tyreek Hill, because you can't go out and find a Tyreek Hill anywhere. But, um, you know, something along those lines. I think that uh, Deshaun Watson needs someone like that. Um, You know, they have invested enough in the offensive line, so I think they're good there. Uh, I think Kareem Hunt's going to be gone, but it seems like they're pretty good at running back uh, with Nick and then with Jerome Ford coming up behind him, and then they'll decide what they want to do with uh, Dearness Johnson. Uh, so they should be okay there. I, you know, for the most part, they're okay at tight end, although they could probably use one more pretty good tight end. Uh, on the defensive side of the ball, uh, you know, are they going to look at, at the talent and say, yeah, we have enough talent, but it wasn't coached the way we need it to be coached? I think they're going to look at that. I think they're going to look at that and they're going to say, 
you know, we've got some really, really good guys on this defense, and for whatever reason, we were not able to pull all of that talent out. Now, we talked to Greg Newsom today, and he's like, yeah, I, I would like to play more on the outside, you know. I feel like my strengths are being able to match up one-on-one with, uh, you know, a great receiver and, and just go for it. So, you know, I think there are other guys in that camp that sort of feel like maybe they need something a little different to happen with them. Uh, but I do think that, yeah, probably there will be some – tweaks on defense and maybe even some surprising ones. I mean, we were we were of course looking at John Johnson's 3 sal- John Johnson 3's salary for next season and it's 13 some million dollars cap hit. Yeah. And uh, these are all decisions that are going to have to be made. Uh, but I think the first thing that will happen is that they will look at um, how the defense and the special teams have been coached. And they'll make some decisions. And, you know, we don't know what the outcome of those decisions will be yet, but I have to think that they will be scrutinized very thoroughly. Okay, so I want to talk more about the Greg Newsom thing. Let's take a break first, and then when we come back, we'll get into a little more of, uh, of what he had to say today. NIL Now, a podcast dedicated to the name, image, and likeness of today's college and high school athletes. NIL is not a cherry on top. It needs to be thought about as a part of these young men and women's future as a nest egg for something when something goes wrong. You know, there's less than 1% of these football players make it to the NFL. You know, their plan B is sometimes not as lofty as plan A. This NIL thing, when you when you ask what's the next important thing, is to make sure that these players are coming to school for education, sports, but also NIL is a close third in that. It's an investment into these players now that they can take advantage of or leverage their name, image, and likeness to, you know, further their careers. So now you have a nest egg after you've invested so much time into your skill set in college. You should be able to leave college with something. This is NIL Now. And we are back on the Orange and Brown Talk podcast. We have Bobby with Mary Kay Cabot and Ashley Bastock here at the Browns facility. So maybe it sounds a little bit different than, than normal, uh, but... Let's talk Greg Newsom. So this is an interesting situation because Newsom spoke today on on Wednesday as we're recording this. And he's like, I mean, you laid it out, Mary Kay. He said um, he wouldn't mind playing more outside. He doesn't mind playing the slot, but he wants it to be more based on matchup than just you're the slot guy, which has been the case this year. And uh, this is an interesting situation because you're going to come back next year and you're going to have Denzel Ward, right? He's locked down on the outside. You're going to have Newsom, who, of course, was a high draft pick and has, has been pretty good in, in his early career. And you've got Martin Emerson, who's kind of emerged. But I don't know if Martin Emerson can play the slot. We haven't really seen it, if he can or not. Whoever the defensive coordinator is, whether it's Joe Woods or it's somebody else, this is a good problem to have, but it's still sort of how do you manage these guys? How do you sort of sort these guys out and make sure that a guy like Greg Newsom? is being taken full advantage of, and you're not just saying, well, we need somebody to play the slot, so it's going to be you. Yeah, I mean, they've got to figure it out. And I think Greg is trying to say, I'm going to talk to them about this after the season. That's what that's what I got to. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And, and he has to do that. Mm-hmm. And anybody else that feels like they should have been used differently, they need to voice that in their ex- exit interviews. They need to express themselves. They need to say, you know, I didn't speak up during the season because I didn't want to rock the boat, but hey, I think my uh, the best use of my talents and abilities you know, is to play on the outside and match up one-on-one and build on things that I did last season or whatever. I'm sure that John Johnson III would say some similar things. He was used in many different ways uh, when he was with the Rams, and he probably feels uh, sort of the same way about some things that could have gone differently for him. Maybe there are other guys that feel the same way. So these are things that are going to have to be uh, discussed, and these guys should not hesitate to speak up. You have to express yourself. Now, maybe the, maybe Greg Newsom will be told, look, those two other guys are our starting outside cornerbacks. You're our best slot guy, and it just is what it is, and that's yeah. what you're going to have to do. And there will be times when you will play on the outside, depending on the formation. But for the most part, you know, you're the best option that we have as the nickel corner. So you never know. But he has to at least 
express himself. Because you also want your star players, and he's a first-round pick, you want your star players to be happy with what they're doing, right? I mean, you, you want them to feel comfortable and, you know, to be excited about their role. And so I think all of this has to be put out on the table in the offseason. Yeah, Ashley, when you were listening to Greg talk today, did, did you kind of get the same sense? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I like. I, I just feel like we would be talking about his second year a lot differently had they used him on the outside more. And, like, to Mary Kay's point, I think, like, when you're talking about this team, if they're saying, oh, well, he's the best we got, it's like, to me, that's a problem. Like, you need to find a guy who, like, I, I think Greg – he has performed admirably in that role, but there are slot guys who are a lot better and a lot more physical out there than Greg. Like, it's just not what he does. It's not what he's done really before. He is more of an outside guy, and that's just that's part of, like, building a team and figuring out where your guys are going to fit best. And I think you kind of have to do both, right? Like, in this year, hey, maybe that was the situation they're in, but I'd like to see them try something different at that spot next year. And, hey, if you have Denzel Ward, Greg Newsom, and Martin Emerson Jr. who can all play outside, that's a great rotation that you can have going. I think that's maybe the rotation that people thought they could have with Greedy, you know, as the number three before they drafted Martin. But, yeah, I, I still would. I think that's what I got from Greg, that, hey, I would – excel more on the outside or would have excelled more this year um, and I think you saw that his rookie year like how well he played against Jamar Chase in that first Bengals game last season I talk about it all the time he didn't allow any catches like you need to get him more outside matchups like that one I think I thought it was interesting I looked up the Bengals game on Halloween and mm-hmm. Denzel Ward did not play in that game so you would expect maybe that would be a game where he would start on the outside Emerson would start on the other side maybe AJ Green would play inside but Greg Newsom only played three outside corner snaps in that game. It was 36, I think, in the slot and three outside. And then the second Bengals game was 49 in the slot and three on the outside. Uh, it was something like that in both of those games. So they were very committed to him being the nickel corner. Like, there was no, there was no question this guy is the nickel corner. And he's going to start on the outside, but when there's three or more out there, he's going to be inside. Yeah, and I don't think it was originally supposed to be like that. They were supposed to cross-train all of those guys so that a number of different guys could play in the slot. But I don't know if no one else just rose to the occasion and sort of outplayed Greg there because it wasn't supposed to be like this. Mm -hmm. He was supposed to be able to bounce back and forth, and they were supposed to... Um, you know, have game plans where they could use other guys in there. And it was going to be more, uh, you know, matchup driven and not just you are the slot, you are the nickel corner. So I don't know kind of where that went off the rails, but it was probably billed to Greg like that too, that, you know, you're going to have an opportunity to do the things that you do best, but you're going to be one of the guys that we also use inside. So uh, that's definitely something to look at. And, you know, would a new coordinator, if they end up with a new coordinator, view it differently? Um, but certainly uh, that was one issue to look at. The adjustments were another issue that they have to look at. The communication issues were something else that they're going to have to look at. You know, the, the blown coverages, which they cleaned those up for the most part. Uh, but, you know, they have to hit the ground running next year. I mean, they can't start off slowly once again and uh, go through what they did this year. And that's kind of the concern, right, Ashley? Like, you could maybe look at this and say, hey, the defense played really well again in the last month or so, six weeks of the season, but can you risk running it back? And then we're here again in the middle of October saying, what is going on with this defense? Yeah, that's what's tough. I mean, it's happened two years in a row now, and it's like last year – And I think to some extent this year, you can kind of like use injuries as the excuse. And last year it was, hey, not only are a lot of these guys hurt, a lot of them were new to this defense. Um, But it's, it's just harder to justify it a second time around. And yes, like there were a lot of injuries, but again, it kind of goes back to the really good teams in this league, figure out game plans and figure out ways to adjust. And 
I just think from everything we heard this year, it just seemed like there was this total disconnect. And like the prime example is the Bengals game, right? <laughs> where the second Bengals game that they lost, where they're like, oh, the players are saying, I don't know, I thought we should have doubled Jamar Chase more. And then Joe Woods comes out and he's like, well, actually, you know, the single coverage matchups like when that Zell was on him, yeah. we, we won most of those. And, the you know, the double teaming, that's when we ran into issues. And it's like... It was the exact opposite thing that we heard like 24 hours apart. And it's, it's that kind of stuff, though, right? It's like that's the glimpse that we get into these rooms. And, and you're seeing it, and it is concerning when you hear stuff like that, I think. Yeah, I think, Mary Kay, that's, that's my biggest issue is there's just been too much. Like this stuff should be in the – we shouldn't be getting those glimpses in those rooms. I'm not going to complain about it. <laughs> Obviously, that's great for us when John Johnson stands up there and talks about guys not watching film and like Ashley was saying, the disconnect between, you know, double coverage and single coverage like that's great for us, but we also shouldn't be hearing that stuff. And I think that's one of the concerns is like it's, it's a very public disconnect and it does kind of make you wonder what it's like, like what we don't know. Well, I mean, Talk about overhearing things. I mean, what about the uh, the game in which I sat in the media room and listen? We listened to screaming. Yes, that, screaming. that was the um, Baltimore game. Yeah, the first ball, the first Baltimore game emanating yeah. from the locker room. I mean, just absolute screaming, and and it was mostly coming from the secondary, and there was talk of a lack of leadership. Um, and you know, that was seemed to be the crux of the issue. And then I think Miles kind of had to go over there and sort of settle things down and break things up a little bit. But I mean, if you're having issues like that, that late in the season, you know, there's some, something going on Mm -hmm. that needs to be addressed. So these are all things that, that will be, uh, you know, just completely dealt with in the off season. And, And we don't know what's coming, but I just have a feeling that there will be some staff changes. Okay, I think that'll do it here for this edition of the podcast. Just make sure you're subscribed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and also uh, go on YouTube and search for Cleveland Browns on cleveland.com to get subscribed to our YouTube channel. You can listen to podcasts there, get uh, post-practice reports, player availabilities, all that stuff uh, there. And, of of course, footballinsider, cleveland.com slash browns, the blue banner at the top of the page to get signed up and get more info on that. Uh, All right, that'll do it. For Mary Kay and Ashley, I'm Dan. Thanks for listening, everybody.